So there was a thing me and Scarlet were talking about that I, that I want to discuss with you guys. For this point, I am talking about the ending of Under the Red Hood. Both the comic and the movie. So if you haven't seen either of those, you might not understand what I'm talking about. And the point I want to talk about is the ending that you subscribe to, be that the movie ending of Under the Red Hood or the comic book ending of Under the Red Hood, will drastically change your view of Batman as a character. In both cases, I think that Jason entered the situation knowing that Batman's not going to shoot the Joker. Jason knows Bruce better than that. He knows he's not going to kill his greatest enemy for any reason. I mean, hell, he didn't kill him when he literally beat a Robin to death. He's not going to kill him because Jason's holding him at gunpoint. But I think that the ending of the story highlights the difference between movie Jason's motivation and comic Jason's motivation. In the movie, Bruce is very calm through the whole ending. He calmly explains why he won't kill anybody because he's afraid of himself sinking into that dark place and never coming back. And when Jason throws him a gun and says, you shoot the Joker or you shoot me, Bruce very calmly looks at him, looks at the gun, says he's not gonna do it, drops the gun, and turns to walk away. Batman won't kill because it will make Batman a worse person, but he accepts the fact that the Joker is a terrible person. And while, yes, he does attack Jason afterwards, it's only after he points the gun at him. Now, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but I don't think it's unreasonable to infer at that moment that there's a potential that Batman might not have stopped Jason if he shot the Joker. He just wouldn't do it himself. Now, the comic, the ending is different. Bruce is much less calm in the comic. Jason tosses him a gun, and Bruce starts to lose his fucking shit. He's yelling and screaming at Jason to stop. When Jason gives him that final choice, Batman screams no before throwing a batarang through Jason's neck. Batman in the comic chooses the Joker's life over Jason's. He will not let Jason kill the Joker to the point where he will throw a almost fatal batarang shot through Jason to stop him from killing the Joker. In the comic, it seems like Jason is threatening to take Batman's plaything away. Now, do I think that that's the entire motivation through the book? No, no, I don't. I don't even think that's the entire motivation in the ending. I am simply saying that whichever ending you subscribe to will change your view of Batman. If you subscribe to the comic book version, Batman won't let anybody kill, period. Regardless of what someone has done, regardless of how, how monstrous something is, he will, he does not accept death. However, if you subscribe to the movie version, there's a potential that Batman has that little bit of moral ambiguity to him. There's a potential that he would have let it happen. He doesn't, he ultimately stops it, but he does start to walk away until Jason threatens his life. I don't know, I think it's an interesting debate. I don't land on either side, I wanna know your guys' opinion. So I was talking with Comic Drake the other day, and something got brought up that I think is kind of a cool point. So I'm a big Marvel fan. I know it doesn't really seem like it. My entire brand is based off Batman shit. I wear superhero stuff all the time, and most of it's DC. I mean, shit, all of the graphic novels that I own are on a publicly available document, and like, half of them are DC. But I promise you, I, I'm also a Marvel fan, boy. I have one comic book tattoo. One. Okay, okay, that's a lie. I actually have two comic book tattoos, but I have only one superhero tattoo, and it's a Marvel superhero. I actually consider myself more of a Marvel fanboy before I started doing TikTok, and I realized that I have a lot more Batman knowledge than I do anything else. So why am I saying all of this? I'm saying all of this because I know virtually nothing about the X-Men. I know a lot about the Weapon Plus program. I know a lot about Weapon X and Deadpool and Captain America. I know a lot about X-Force and like Avengers versus X-Men, kind of. But I don't really know all that much about the X-Men outside of like their super, super major crossover events with the rest of Marvel. And I think it's kind of because the X-Men are kind of a pocket universe inside of Marvel. They have their own lore and stories and, and things that impact them in a very major way, but don't really impact the rest of the Marvel Universe in a very similar way. Or like they have things that should that don't really get talked about all that much. Like the X-Men have been living on a sentient island with the ability to bring people back from the dead for like, how many years now? How is that not all every single Marvel character is talking about all the time? For fuck's sake, the X-Men have their own space lore. Like the rest of the Marvel Universe has the Kree and the Scrolls and the Silver Surfer and Galactus and all of that. And the X-Men have their own little section. They have the Shi'ar Empire, which only really interacts with them. Or at least they were majorly introduced from 
the X-Men. Again, I don't know very much, so the Shi'ar might be something way bigger than I'm very aware of. Like, I just think it's really fascinating. You can say you are a Marvel fan, or you could say you're an X-Men fan, and those have the possibility to be completely mutually exclusive. It's kind of like how Batman exists in his own little world outside of the DC universe. Like, big stories and events happen in Batman books that don't really affect everybody else. And because of that, it feels like he has his own little universe in the middle of DC. I would try and argue that Spider-Man's kind of in the similar vein, but Spider-Man makes so many crossovers with so many characters that I kind of doubt it. Shit, the amazing Spider-Man number two, he tries to join the fucking Fantastic Four. Like, he's built on the back of cameos. I mean, I don't know. X-Men fans in my audience, please tell me, am I, am I wrong about this? Or do the X-Men kind of have their own little section of the Marvel Universe that's kind of just their own, bordering on it being its own continuity? I don't know. Let me know in the comments. All right, so I think I have this handle. After the last time that I did a regrettable superhero, I went through and manually took out every character we have already done. Did I get all of them? Probably the fuck not, because somehow I keep forgetting these things. But I am decently sure I got all of them. I hope. We're gonna see. Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly non-weekly show where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes, and then I run on the fuck down. Let's get someone new today, shall we? Do not fuck me on this. Who we getting? Who we getting? Who we getting? The super su- No, please, 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 no! I come to talk about the obscure superheroes, and everything in my life just says, nope. Nope, you get Batman. That's all you get. I started a comic book review show, and both votes that I put out, people went, Nope, you get Batman. Y'all are lucky I like this fucking superhero. Okay, so, um, so that's just, that's just Superman and Batman. That's not even a different costume. That's just, that's just soups and bats. Why the shit does Batman's kid have those fucking sideburns? Man's looks like he's about to start singing about his blue suede shoes. The irony that both of these characters have real canonical children now. And one of them, did, yeah, just, it just is Superman. I cannot wait to hear who their mothers are. Uh... Okay, all right, let's 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 get into it. The Super Sons of Batman and Superman were created by the most 70s sounding people of all time, that being Bob Haney and Dick Dillon. In World's Finest Comics, Volume 1, number 215 of DC Comics in January of 1973. The Super Sons of Batman and Superman are simply called Batman Jr. and Superman Jr. What might be their alter egos, you whack? Clark Kent Jr. and Bruce Wayne Jr. I wish, I wish I was fucking kidding. The explicit purpose of these characters' creations is because the original readers of the original adventures of Batman and Superman would be about in their mid-40s. So they wanted Superman and Batman to appeal to a younger audience. So instead of doing the whole sliding time frame thing that comics have always done, they just had them have children? And, and made them contemporary. Contemporary for the 1970s, at least. There is no explanation where they came from. Their mothers are never revealed. Superman and Batman aren't aged up. They're the exact same age as they are in their individual books. Robin is still a fucking teenager. But apparently Batman and Superman have college-age children. It is revealed in their final issue that they are, in fact, not real, but are computer simulations created by Batman and Superman to judge the idea of fatherhood in their superheroic lives. Apparently they were briefly brought to life and then sacrificed themselves to save the world somehow. I would say this idea has potential and that it could be brought back, but the idea was already brought back a thousand times better. Go read Super Sons. This shit, however... Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and leave that one in the 70s, huh? So, I will be the first to admit that I did indeed miss Star Wars Day. Again. How am I so bad at this? But in belated celebration of it, I have a fact that I saw. Apparently, Jedi Fallen Order, the new Star Wars game that just released, and the series Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney Plus take place in the same year. And with that information, it brought a question to mind. That question being, in all seriousness, how effective are the Inquisitors? For those of you who don't know, the Inquisitors are dark side users under the employ of Darth Vader. They first appeared in Star Wars Rebels back in 2014 and are essentially like a Jedi hit squad. Vader sends them out to go track down Jedi because sending out normal stormtroopers is a death sentence. And we are meant to believe that they are absolutely terrifying in how good they are. They are all former Jedi or former younglings that have been forcibly converted to the dark side through means of torture and manipulation. According to Wikipedia, the earliest chronological appearance of an Inquisitor takes place in 19 BBY. 
For those of you who don't know, 19 BBY means 19 years before the Battle of Yavin, and the Battle of Yavin is also nerd speak for A New Hope. So the first time an Inquisitor shows up is 19 years before A New Hope. All right, good, we got it? Great. Do you want to know how much they get fucking dunked on before the New Hope starts? Jedi Fallen Order takes place in 14 BBY, so 14 years before A New Hope. In that game, effectively, you take out two Inquisitors. A single amnesiac 18-year-old former Padawan takes out two of these guys. Now, I haven't finished or even really played more than the first mission of Jedi Survivor, so I can't really speak on that game. But I know that that takes place in 9 BBY. You want to know what else takes place at 9 BBY? Obi-Wan, where he effectively takes out another Inquisitor. I mean, if we want to get pedantic about it, out of the three failed Inquisitors, none of the Jedi really took them out. Only one's been taken out by a Jedi, really. Uh, two of them have been taken out by Darth Vader himself, so. Anyway, moving on, we don't even get to Rebels, where the Inquisitors were introduced and serve as essentially the guys who get fucked on the entire show. I'm not saying they're not threatening. I'm not saying they're not threatening. What I am saying is that the Inquisitors exist for at least 19 years. Their ranks are denoted by single digits. First sister, second sister, second brother, third brother. There is at most 18 of them. We have met 12 in canon through comics, TV shows, video games, and of those 12, 10 are dead! I'm just saying, half of your fucking hit squad here is just fucking gone! I'm not even gonna get started on the fact that their home base gets invaded successfully by two separate Jedi in the span of five years. I just question the effectiveness is all. So this morning I went to Twitter to complain about the editing process of my newest YouTube video. While I was there, I realized that the hashtag Gotham was trending for some reason. When I went to check why, it's because there was a lot of conversations about what would happen if Marvel and Gotham specifically switched superheroes. Who would complete, essentially, the boss rush faster? Which group is gonna clear the other supervillains quicker than the other? Now that's not the thing that interested me. Marvel would obviously wipe the fucking board with Gotham so fucking fast. 98% of Marvel stories take place in New York City, meaning 98% of Marvel characters are New York based. Meaning that 98% of Marvel superheroes are now going to specifically Gotham. So yeah, Marvel wipes the fucking board. My interest was in the secondary joke that spawned off of it. That being, what what if just the Punisher went to Gotham? Now the overall consensus that I was seeing is that people were thinking the Punisher would just wipe the fucking floor. He's the goddamn Punisher. It would be like taking candy from a baby. It would be just a fucking kid in a candy store, bull in a china shop. He would destroy that city. I never want to be the um actually sort of comic book guy. However, um, actually, not only has the Punisher already gone to Gotham, one of Marvel's very scant few crossovers with DC, Punisher went to Gotham and damn near killed the Joker within like a day. But also, Gotham already has like four or five Punisher, or at least Punisher adjacent character. Most obvious of which being Lockup, who was an ex-cop who thought that the law was way too soft on criminals and after being indicted became an anti-villain to essentially clear that problem up. Then you got Clown Killer, who was essentially just the Punisher for Joker. If you really want to stretch the definition, I guess you could include Red Hood. They're not the same fucking character. They are not the same fucking character. I'll fight until my dying day that they are not the same fucking character. I mean, hell, Batwoman essentially has Wolverine's morals of I'm gonna do everything I can not to kill you, but if that's the final option, I'm not gonna hesitate. And if we want to extend the definition to people who kill who are on the good guy's side, then, I mean, Harley Quinn is also there. But don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the Punisher wouldn't have a fucking heyday in Gotham City. I am, however, saying that the Punisher in every non-Punisher book gets his ass fucking handed to him by basically anyone with superpowers. Hell, sometimes the Punisher gets his ass beat in Punisher book. Spider-Man kicks his ass, Wolverine kicks his ass, Captain America kicks his ass. So while I think that the Punisher would definitely be able to clear fucking house and just fucking annihilate all basically human Batman threats, Falcone and Maroney are gone, Joker would probably be gone, Penguin, Riddler, Scarecrow, all of them gone. I think that the more otherworldly, eldritch, scary Gotham stuff, Clayface, Poison Ivy, characters like that, I think they might give the Punisher a little bit of trouble. I'm not saying he wouldn't win eventually, but I don't think it would be the absolute fucking clean sweep that a lot of people seem to think it would be. I don't know, am I just a Batman fanboy? I want to know your guys' opinion. The Punisher in Gotham, how easy is this? Okay, I have a very important question for you guys. Off the top of your head, what were the steps that Dick Grayson took to becoming Robin? When was he adopted? Put put your answer in the comment and, and then, then come back. All right, you put it down there? You confident about your answer? I was pretty confident about mine until a couple days ago. Panda Scarlet is a lot more read up on old school Jason Todd and Dick Grayson Robin. 
Her favorite comic book run of all time is the old school detective comics run from the 80s. And she has read damn near every single comic book that has Robin in it since he was introduced. Now I grew up on mid-2000s comics. My knowledge of the Dick Grayson and Jason Todd runs are very much based off of secondhand accounts when they talk about it later in life. So my impression of the Dick Grayson Robin story was to be honest, kind of taken from All-Star Batman and Robin. Like a mix of that and the origin given to him in the Batman and Robin movie with fucking Val Kilmer. Bruce Wayne takes Dick Grayson in after the death of his parents to try and give him a better life. Dick Grayson discovers that he's Batman and wants in on it. Batman says no. Dick Grayson proves his worth and becomes Robin. That was how I thought it happened. Correction, that is how I was confident that it happened. But apparently no, you can look this up on the DC Wiki. Dick Grayson was put into the fucking foster system and then into a Catholic orphanage and then Bruce Wayne adopted him. I don't know why I was under the impression that he just took this kid up off of the fucking surface floor and was like, yep, that sucks, your parents are dead, let's go back to my mansion. But I mean, that makes way more sense. And not only did Dick not discover that he was Batman first, Dick was just annoyed that Bruce was never there because he was being Batman, but Dick didn't know that. So Dick went out to solve a mystery and a crime on his own, only to then run into Batman, who knocks him out and brings him back to the cave to be like, hey man, um, how about, how about if you're gonna do this, I fucking watch so you don't, you know, die. By the way, I'm your fucking foster dad. Not really, Bruce adopted him as a ward because he didn't want to replace Dick's actual father because Dick was old enough to remember his actual father. It's a whole thing. Dick wasn't adopted until he was in his 20s. Anyway, it's only then that they go out and catch Tony Zuko, who is Dick's parents' murderer, who apparently dies of a heart attack, only for then Batman to be like, okay, you obviously have a little bit of a knack for this shit, and I see a little bit of myself in you, so how's about being a childhood sidekick? I dare you to guess how long he trained Dick Grayson to be Robin. I dare you to guess how long it took him to train a eight-year-old child to be good enough to fight crime. Six months. He trained this kid for six fucking months. That's it. And was like, yep, we're gonna put you in short shorts and throw you in front of some guns. That sounds like a great plan. Anyway, you learn something new every day. I was completely wrong about the origin. My God. Yeah, you wanna know the most annoying shit about this? I'm like, I don't know, 90% sure that the Titans team just roll a D20, and if they get anything above a 16, they decide that they're gonna put something comic accurate in. Because they get the most random and obscure bullshit and make that the stuff that they get right. Origin of Red Hood as a character? Fuck it, gonna completely trash that. How Jason Todd died? Nah, not gonna include that. The entire motivation of Jason Todd as a character. Not, not important. But you know what we are gonna get right? Batman and Dick Grayson being at such odds with each other that they're barely even talking by the time that Jason Todd is adopted. Batman giving Jason the Robin name without Dick's permission. Dick and Bruce slightly rekindling their relationship because of the fact that Jason Todd brought them back together. Bruce not telling Dick about the fact that Jason Todd rushing the funeral so that Dick isn't even there when it happens. Dick having to find out about all of the information about Jason's death through the Bat computer which he has to break into. All of that, all of that is completely comic book accurate. I swear it's just for fucking Batman lore that they decide to just roll the fucking dice and decide if it's true or not. All right, right now, I should definitely be working on my YouTube video. Like, not even a question. It's late, I should be editing that video because I said I would be doing that this week. But people keep fucking talking about Guardians 3 and I don't want to get fucking spoiled. So I'm going to go and see Guardians 3 and I'm going to come back and give you guys my opinion. I've always really liked the Guardians movies. Some of their humor can get a little bit touch and go sometimes, but I usually really, really like these movies. I think James Gunn is one of the best superhero movie directors that we've gotten. Like I said, can the humor be a little touchy sometimes? Yeah, it definitely can. It's not for everybody, and sometimes it's not for me. But I do think that he understands the ability to, to balance the dramatics of a superhero story with the uh, humorous aspects of it. Superhero stories are still grown adults in, in tights beating the shit out of bad guys. It's an inherently funny concept. So I'm gonna go and see the movie, and then I'm gonna report back to you guys and tell you what I thought, okay? Okay. So spoiler free, that movie's like a D&D &D campaign. Like, no shit, this might be uh, a little bit tainted by by the D&D the &D campaign that I'm a part of. By the way, go to watch d and Dorks every Friday over on Sir Superheroes Twitch page. But that, that movie plays very much like a D&D &D campaign, which is not a bad thing. That's high praise. I really did enjoy the more melancholic approach to a Guardians movie. I feel like the other two were very poppy, colorful, in your face. They were very humorous movies that were also very, like, bright. They dealt with some darker subject matter, and James Gunn does know how to hammer you in the fucking feels. But I feel like this movie kind of 
dealt in a place of like unresolved issue. A lot of characters have a lot of shit that they need to say to each other that they don't, and that's real, and I, re I really appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that we got a unsympathetic villain for the first time in a while. The High Evolutionary is a piece of fucking shit, and I love him for it. He's played so well. And I was really nervous going into this movie because I've never really liked the High Evolutionary as a character. Don't know why, just never really spoke to me. But he was done really fucking well in this movie. They got away with a lot of fucking body horror. I will also say that it did feel like a send-off, especially near the end of the movie. It feels like a send-off to the Guardians of the Galaxy from James Gunn. I know he said in interviews that he would be okay with another director picking up the Guardians, but it very much feels like this is a good place to just kind of leave them off. We don't really need to, to pick them back up again. They're at a good spot right now. I will also say, not in personality, but in the show of his power, I am very excited for James Gunn's Superman movie, specifically based off of his interpretation of Adam Warlock in this. And I didn't mind the comic change of Adam Warlock's personality. He's, he's a lot different than he is in the comics, but I do really appreciate this version because I think it's fun. Overall, I'm going to give the movie a solid 7 or 8 out of 10. I had a lot of fun. That was a really good movie. I'll probably make a full spoilers video a little bit after this. So no spoilers in the comments of this one. Got it? All right. I'll see you guys then. Do people judge? I don't, are you clap if you're judging her? Oh. Finally, someone fucking says it. Listen, I know that a lot of people really, really like Frank Whiteley's art. I know that Frank Whiteley's art works with a lot of people's stories. I know that Frank Whiteley is a very renowned comic book artist, and I know that that is for a reason. Do I also think that the level of lines that he puts on characters make them look like they are either raisins or shriveled up prunes? Yeah, a little bit. There are certain artists who work in such a stylized range that it is very... It's 50-50 it's on whether you love them or you fucking hate their art style. Frank Quietly is one of those artists! Why are there so many lines? Listen, I don't want this to be three minutes of bashing on Frank Whiteley, so here, here's some positives. The man is absolutely dedicated to detail. Shit like this is what makes a really good comic artist. I almost made my first episode of my YouTube comic book review show on All-Star Superman, and while reading it, I realized that there are a shit ton of background details in the artwork that no one else would have even thought to include. There are pages where you can see characters notice things with their eyes, not say anything, handle that situation, and come back without it ever being mentioned in the script. And that's impressive. That is a level of dedication to the art of details that is so very impressive. And I've never heard anything bad about the guy. But God, I do not enjoy his artwork. It is a slog to get through books that are drawn by him. And fuck it, while I'm here, I'm in the same my fucking piece. I feel the same goddamn way about Tim Sale. Why does everybody look like that? Oh, Panda, your favorite artist is Alex Ross. You just like realism. Yeah, I do. But I also love stylized work. There are just some times that I personally feel like stylization goes a little bit too far. And people like Frank Quietly and Tim Sale go that extra distance in stylization where it pushes past like a general market level to a you're gonna love this art, you're gonna fucking hate this art. And another one to the pile, I feel the exact same way about late career to modern Frank Miller. Sometimes comic art is to a level of stylization that it is going to push that line of people are going to hate the artwork or they're going to vehemently defend the artwork. And both sides are equally valid because art is completely subjective. I live my entire life by the rule that every piece of art is someone's favorite piece of art. Anybody can do art and all art is good. However, that doesn't change the defending opinion that People's opinions are people's opinions, and if people don't like the fucking artwork, some people just don't like the fucking artwork. Me personally, I'm in this person's camp. Goddamn, I, Frank quietly just pushes that fucking line for me, man. I am off. I am off to get myself a little treat. Why might I be off to get myself a little treat, you might ask? Well, you see, it's because Premiere Pro has decided to fuck me today. Last night, I uploaded the YouTube video I've been working on for the better part of a month. Now, I fucked up on my own. I, I scheduled the video to be uploaded at 12 a.m. thinking that was noon, not realizing that noon is 12 p.m. So my video was released in the middle of the night when nobody was fucking awake. And of course, views were fucking abysmal. That's already bad enough, but that is not how Premiere fucked me. No, Premiere fucked me when I went to review that video and realized that the exported video that I had uploaded did not have any of the edits that I had made in the past 24 hours. That includes music, sound effects, multiple images that were essential for the video. Just didn't fucking exist. They didn't even exist in the file save. I don't know if it glitched, I don't know if something happened, 
but I deserve a little treat. Specifically because I didn't fucking kill someone as a result. But I'm gonna try and turn this around. I'm gonna try to be a little motivational with this. I took down a video at 2,000 views on the first day of it being uploaded, knowing full well that I might not get those 2,000 views back. On a YouTube channel that's views have steadily been declining because YouTube doesn't know how to push my content when I post both TikTok compilations and fully edited YouTube video. And why did I do that? Because it wasn't my vision. At the end of the day, sometimes luck might just spit in your fucking face. The world might turn around and fuck you over repeatedly. And sometimes it might fuck you over with something you're passionate about. And you just gotta accept that and move on. Lose your mind a little bit, go get yourself a treat, and then try and fix it. I'm on my way back to the studio right now so I can finish the edit. And the second episode of the Comic Book Book Club should be uploaded by tomorrow, or maybe the day after that at the latest. Thank you to everybody who already watched the unfinished version. Let's hope I remember what time noon is this time. So me and Scarlett went to a concert last night, and I I just have a note for, for all the dudes that watch my videos. Guys, dudes, bros, um, if your girlfriend takes you to an event, show some fucking excitement. I can't tell you how many of these fucking dudes that I saw when I was just walking like up to go and get drinks or go to the bathroom or something that were standing like a fucking plank of wood not even trying to fake enjoyment on their face dude your partner brought you to this event for you to enjoy with them if you don't enjoy the event at least enjoy the fact that your partner is enjoying the event don't stand there like a fucking plank of wood acting like a jackass throwing a fit like a child i'm sorry that annoyed the shit out of me i just needed to tell it to to, to the general audiences anyway welcome back to regrettable superhero of the week the weekly not weekly show where i pick one character out random of the league of regrettable superheroes and then i run them the fuck down most fucking out of left field intro i've ever fucking done who are we gonna get today? Please be someone fun that isn't from Marvel or DC, I'm begging you. The fa- the face! I swear if this is the same as the eye, and it's just a fucking floating face, I'm gonna lose my goddamn mind. I shit you not, he is the page after the eye. That is hilarious. Is- Is he just the mask? I swear to God, is this character just the mask? Also, if I'm not mistaken, that looks like Blanca from Street Fighter, right? This dude's whole fucking power is just putting a goddamn Halloween mask on and then scaring the shit out of people. I am begging you, please let that be what this is. It, this dude's just kind of boring. The face was created by Mark Bailey with Gardner Fox and Vice Sullivan as Michael Blake in Big Shot Comics number one of Columbia Comics in May of 1940. The face's real name is Tony Trent. By day, he is a radio announcer and part-time newscaster who, after becoming so enraged with the news stories that he would be reporting, decided to become a nighttime vigilante. How might he do this, you might ask? He's... He's essentially just, like, a private eye. He's like a detective. He's like Batman, but shitty. Just a nighttime vigilante and detective who uses a mask to cover his identity and scare the shit out of criminals. Yes, that is his only gimmick. This fright mask is the only thing that gives him an advantage. He's essentially just a pulp detective with a gimmick. No gadgets, no superpowers, no supervillains, no continuous enemy. And somehow, this is one of the longest running characters that we have covered on this show. He had over a hundred appearances in the Golden Age. He was an active character for six years! This radio announcer with a Halloween mask was an effective superhero for six years! I feel like the only way that I would feel comfortable bringing this guy back is as like a parody character. Like he tries to show up in Gotham and everyone's like, what? No, man, we fight Batman. Who the fuck are you? I don't know, someone might be able to do something nice with him. But for me, it's gonna be regrettable. He's just a guy! For a long time in video games, there's been a discourse about how a Superman game would work. How do you make it fun? How I swear, man, y'all are doing too much. There's no disrespect to the original creator. The original creator had an idea of essentially, like, there, use a way to get Superman's powers away from him. Very much how, like, Justice League Unlimited put him under a red sun, and then he was just kind of working on Earth as, like, somewhat of a normal human. However... I scoff at you. Be scoffed at. Scoff. You want to know my defense on how to make a good Superman game? Give him all his most recognizable powers. Yeah, all of them. Make an open world, make it Metropolis, and then have him fight a character like Lex Luthor or one of his more basic human characters. But Panda, the power differential, that wouldn't make any sense. Superman's so strong, he'd be able to solve all of the problems in like 10 seconds. You know what I say to that? You're right. So, 
could Spider-Man? So could Batman! You want to know how games like Spider-Man PS4, with characters that are immensely powerful, still work? You restrict the character's powers without telling the player that you're doing that. From a pure power scaling standpoint, could Spider-Man take the head off of every single person that he punches at any time? Yeah! How do Octavius learn that shit the hard way? Would you like to know why that doesn't happen in Spider-Man PS4? Because Peter Parker, from a moral standpoint, would not punch someone's jaw off. So the player does not get the ability to punch someone's jaw off. You want to know how you make a Superman game fun? You make Superman strong enough to be able to destroy basically any robot that's thrown at him, as well as being able to stop crimes at a petty street level, and you make it so that that strength differential is not in the player's hands. Make the robots harder to fight, but still make it so that he can beat them. And make the humans easy to fight, but still make it a little bit of a challenge. The same way that they did for Spider-Man, who can canonically carry a skyscraper. Whenever people think about how to make a fun Superman game, they think too goddamn hard. Superman is powerful. Hell, even a broken level of powerful sometimes. And I understand that it's hard to think about how you could make that fun. But in Jedi Survivor, you play a fully knighted Jedi Knight. One of the most powerful warriors in the galaxy. And you want to know what? You're carrying a laser sword that can cut metal in half, and it does not cut stormtroopers in half. You want to know why? Because it's taken out of the hands of the player. The game decides how strong your lightsaber is. And to make the game fun, the lightsaber is not as strong. You don't need to canonically give a reason for Superman to not be as powerful. Just add in the fact that Superman, logically, wouldn't fucking break someone with his bare hands and craft a good Superman story around that and have him play with that. Am I saying never depower him during the game? Of course not. I think it would be fun if at one point, all of a sudden, you get, like, solar flare and all of a sudden you're working with a super restricted power set. And now you gotta fight some people without your normal powers until they come back. That would be cool. Maybe make that an attack that you only get sometimes. But you don't need to depower Superman for a whole game to make it fun. And you by no means need to make the bad guy stronger than him to make a Superman game fun. Doc Ock is not stronger than Spider-Man. He was still a good villain for that game. The Tinkerer was not stronger than Miles Morales, and she was still fun for that game. I don't know, that's my opinion. Okay, so I was doing some research for my newest comic book book club video. The newest episode is going to be on Batman Year One, which I put out in the video is closer to being like Gordon Year One. It's a lot more of a Jim Gordon story than it is a Batman story, but because of it being mostly a Gordon story, I had to do some research into the Gordon family history, which... This, this fucking family is confusing, and it gets more confusing with every reboot. First thing you gotta remember is there's only really two big reboots in DC history. Crisis on Infinite Earths, and the New 52. Alright, so pre-crisis, we got the simplest string of events. There is Commissioner Jim Gordon, head of the police, works with Batman, yada yada yada. Commissioner has a daughter, her name is Barbara Gordon, she's backer. She's got a PhD, she runs the Gotham Library, and that's basically it. Not too hard to follow right now, right? Alright, Crisis on Infinite Earths happens, what the fuck changed? So year one, we got Jim Gordon, right? Jim Gordon has a pregnant wife. Her name is Barbara Gordon. No, not that Barbara Gordon. This is Barbara Eileen Gordon. No one in this family has an original name, and it gets worse. Barbara Eileen Gordon is pregnant with Jim Gordon's son. You want to know what his name is? James Gordon Jr. So if you're keeping track at home, that's Jim Gordon, Jim Gordon, Barbara Gordon, and Barbara Gordon. So for the purposes of this video, this is Barbara Eileen, and this is James Gordon Jr. Or just James for short, okay? Okay, it's year one. We got Commissioner Gordon and his pregnant wife, Barbara Eileen. Well, during the events of year one, Jim Gordon has an affair with a woman named Sarah Essen. After their affair goes a little bit too far, Sarah moves to New York. She comes back later. Jim and Barbara Eileen had their son, Jane. Wait, but Panda, I thought you said that Jim had a daughter named Barbara. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. This is post-crisis on Infinite Earths. We can't be having that shit anymore. For some fucking reason, Barbara is now Jim Gordon's niece. Why? Who fucking knows? It's the 80s. Anyway, Barbara Gordon has her own parents. I couldn't find a picture of them. Anyway, they mysteriously die in a car crash at some point after year one, and Jim and Barbara Eileen end up taking her in and adopting her as their daughter. So post-crisis, Barbara Gordon is Jim Gordon's niece, except she's not actually his niece, she's his adopted daughter, but also his niece at the exact same time. Also at some point after year one, Barbara Eileen leaves Jim Gordon, taking James with her. So now we're at a very similar stage to pre-crisis, where it's just Jim Gordon and Barbara Gordon in Gotham working with Batman. Except, ah, you remember how I said that Sarah was gonna come back? Yet yeah, Jim gets remarried to Sarah Essen. So now the Gordon family in Gotham is Jim Gordon, Sarah Essen Gordon, and Barbara Gordon all living in Gotham. And Barbara Eileen and Jim 
James Gordon are off somewhere else. James Gordon eventually comes back as a serial killer and we never hear from Barbara Eileen again. Oh yeah, James Gordon is a serial killer. Not to mention that. That's part of the reason that they left is that he was showing sociopathic tendencies. Joker also kills Sarah Essen during No Man's Land. So we're back to Jim Gordon and Barbara Gordon and James Gordon Jr. is here but he's locked up. Oh, but now the New 52 has to happen. Post New 52, Barbara Gordon is no longer Jim Gordon's niece. She's his biological daughter again. And Barbara Eileen didn't leave Jim Gordon for just being a dickhead. She walked out on the family because Jane threatened to kill Barbara if she didn't for some fucking reason. Somehow that is now the established canon. All of this is just my really roundabout way of saying that Barbara Gordon is not Jim Gordon's niece anymore. Just, uh, just stop saying that. I am about to have one of the busiest weeks I have ever had. I just got back from a solid four days of camping. And I'm not talking lot camping, I'm talking going out with my girlfriend's marine dad sort of camping, so I'm sleeping on the ground fucking sticks camping. Next weekend I am a guest at NocoCon in Watertown, New York. Come check me out if you haven't bought tickets yet. Which I have done a total of one ad for, so I need to do more videos about that. Have it printed shit out to be able to actually, like, sign there, so I need to do that. I'm in the middle of editing episode three of my YouTube show, so I need to do that. This is all on top of that actually preparing and packing for that trip, so I need to do that. So yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a fun week. In lieu of all of that, um, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run the fuck down. Oh, uh, let's get something easy, shall we? Give me someone fun and I'm hoping that it's not from Marvel or DC. What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? What do we got? Man, man, wolf, man, wolf. That sounds disturbingly Marvel, so we're gonna see. I fucking called it. I don't. I, I don't even really know where to start here. This is a villainous ass fit. Let, let's just be honest about that. This is not the look of a hero. This is the bad guy at the end of the fight. Also, is he just fighting humans in the back? What are they riding? Are those like fucking elephant horses? Swords and sorcery beyond the stars. I swear to God, if this ends up being an answer to Star Wars, I'm gonna lose my shit. I could not have been more wrong. This, this, this is somehow an established character. Man Wolf was created by Gary Conaway and Gil Kane in Amazing Spider-Man number 124 of Marvel Comics in September of 1973. Now I bet you're wondering why he was created in the pages of Spider-Man. Well that's because this guy, that's right, this guy right here, is J. Jonah Jameson's son. This is John Jameson, the astronaut son of J. Jonah Jameson. He had been and has been a reoccurring Spider-Man character, given missing the the fur and the fangs and the red eyes and shit. However, apparently he was turned into a superhero when on returning to the moon, he found a gemstone that turned him into the Man Wolf or Star God, depending on who you ask. The name of the book is Man Wolf, but they call him Star God within the, within the pages. And that's because the amulet was left there by a race of medieval people that live in a pocket dimension inside of the moon. And whoever has the amulet becomes the wolf-headed warrior king named the Star God. Yeah, this, this didn't last long. John Jameson is back to being normal. Sometimes he turns into this, but not, not, not a lot. And they very rarely mention the, the majority of this shit. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say, yeah, I don't, I don't really think I need to explain this one. You had a good thing going. You were a side character in a Spider-Man story. And what are the cool ones at that? You didn't need to be a man-wolf, man. You've existed since Spider-Man's first fucking comic. Regrettable, regrettable. This is fucking regrettable. Okay, so we need to talk about this and we're gonna break it down. I mean all the way down because i feel like this is you know what i want to talk about this too a little bit if you haven't watched straw hat's original video he's reacting to a comment saying that his content has become more about him in comparison to when he started where it was more about movie and he goes on to refute that excellently i might add and i want to jump on this as well because i have also experienced this a little bit not to the extent the straw hat has for good fucking reason but comments in a similar vein to that i've gotten multiple comments that ask why i do a lot more conversational bits now i started out the meat of my comic book content creator career doing skits primarily bat fam related skits i got big off of the back of multiple series that i put out all of them being skit series but the longer that i went on the more i started to move away from that and i've had comments that are like why aren't you doing those skits anymore panda when are we getting this series back when are we getting this series back man i miss this series that sort of thing and don't get me wrong i like those comments to a certain extent because it means that people are sticking around they, they've been around since i did those series but i feel like there is a certain expectation on content creators to find your niche and fucking stay there 
because that's what you're actually here for. You are a means to a type of content that they want. Now, I did not ask for fans, and I absolutely don't ask for my fans to be fans of me and not fans of my content. I know that one is a much bigger ask than the other, and I'm also aware that I don't fucking want stands. I don't want fans of me that put me on a pedestal. I want people to like what I do, which those comments represent. However, because content creators are elevated to a status of minor celebrity, again, very minor celebrity, I feel like the way that people interact with content creators is much different than they would interact with someone who is much smaller, who has not been making videos for three years, who doesn't have a million followers. I had a conversation with my father recently about this very same topic. Unlike people who create bigger amounts of content, content creators are in charge of everything that they do. And because of that, the content that we make is going to be shaped by where we are in life and what we're doing and who we are at that moment. And when you follow an account like that, it is still an account of a person. At least for the most part. I know that there's big brands and people who have media teams or whatever, but for the most part, it's a person making content because they want to. Something I really love to do with my fan base is to look directly at the fourth wall and address the fact that there isn't one there. On my Twitch, I constantly talk about what what it's like behind the camera and what it's like putting on the persona of the panda red it's one of my favorite things to do because in my mind i think it helps dissuade this view of like the nebulous content creator who makes one type of content i am a comic fan i like making content as a comic book fan and as a comic book fan how i choose to show that changes with time am i saying that i'll never go back to those skits that i'll never try and do that old style of content again of course not no i was planning out a skit not 10 minutes ago but i think it is both the job of the person ingesting the content as well as the person making it to address the fact that it's just a person making content when you follow that person you're following a person if any of that makes sense and that is going to be it for this month. I just want to take a moment to thank all of my lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. Amanda Barnstead, Andra Lanowitz, Bill Bro, Brandon Bilbrey, Brandon Laney, Brian Van Vorst, Carol Cowett, Christopher Bosgard, Danny Walker, Dark Nimbus, Devaniculus, Dragon Fang, Elizabeth Rush, Fireball Sensei, Gas Boss Gate Light Girl Keep, Have a Heart Tin Man, Jacob Safel, Jeffrey Aviles, Caitlin Kelly, Cat Q, Kathy Coker, Katie Hawkins, Magu, Max Baker, Nixie Shimo, Pandora A, Pinchy Mugre, Righteous Duke, Ricky Tiki Davi, Tangled Web, The Brain Teaser, The Holy Corota, Thomas Randolph, T.S. Famder, Ultraviolet, and Wofu Badge 2, as well as all of my other lovely, lovely patrons over on Patreon. And if you too would like your name read out at the end of every single YouTube video I do on this channel, as well as having the ability to vote on new episodes of the Comic Book Book Club as they come out, feel free to hop on over to my Patreon and donate at least $15 or more. Or hey, if that's not an option, even a dollar helps. I am literally recording this as I am, like, getting ready to head to NokoCon for this month. It, it's literally in two days. I'm hoping I can get this video out in enough time for people to be seeing it while I'm on the plane. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you guys are ready for the next episode of the Comic Book Book Club. I'm editing that video on the plane while I am going. So thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for sticking around. And I will see you next time.